when they ask you regarding the hope that's in you, we're not supposed to be like, man, what do I say? We're supposed to be ready. It's imper- imperative that you understand the context regarding giving the answer for what the hope is that you have. When you're salt and you're light in the world and you are sanctifying Christ as Lord in your hearts, as Yahweh, it's going to happen eventually, or it should happen eventually. Welcome back to the Good Fight Radio Show. I'm your host, Chad Davidson of Good Fight Ministries. And with me, as always, is the president and founder of Good Fight Ministries and pastor of Blessed Hope Chapel in Simi Valley, California, Pastor Joe Schimmel. How are we doing today? Doing great. I'm excited about when we talking about our Blessed Hope today, man. <laughs> Amen. So praise the Lord. To that. Uh, really, really exciting. In fact, uh, a lot of this episode, as well as the last episode that we did, stems from a teaching that Pastor Joe did at Blessed Hope Chapel, at our home fellowship. And you guys can always join us every Monday and Wednesday. Pacific Standard Time would be 7.30 on Wednesdays and 9 a.m. where you get the whole worship and also the message package there every Sunday. And also, if you're part of the live stream group, um, you if you have one of the live stream groups, we're starting a leadership Zoom meeting. Actually, it's going to be one time a month. The first one's going to be July 23rd that I'll be leading for you guys. So you guys are more than welcome to join in on that and hopefully help out uh, you know, maybe get understanding some distinctives from Blessed Hope Chapel and hopefully get along with some teaching as well. But nonetheless, this all stems from us talking about this because we had a couple of shows already planned for this week that when we started talking about the message that he had done just last Wednesday, it just, hey, let's start talking about this. And next thing you know, we're in the middle of a message and we don't get to all the points we want to get to. So you're, I'm really excited. We'll, I'll do a quick recap for you guys. And then we'll get right into the final two points, which I think, I don't want to say two of the most important, because as we talked about specifically, when we talk about giving a defense for our faith, the fact is that 1 Peter 3.15 is the most popular verse when it comes to, and maybe the most important verse when it comes to apologetics. And so we were talking specifically about in 1 Peter 3.15, and I will just read the verse so that you guys can have it here. And it says, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is within you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And typically, when we go to this verse, and like I said, if we had been to an apologetics conference, you can't miss. This verse is up there. And that word defense, as we talked about, is apologia or apologia or apologia, you know. Uh, That's one thing that's funny about Koine Greek when it came to Alexander the Great conquering so much space in so little time, everyone learning Greek, it sounds a little different wherever you're talking. So sometimes people say, that's how it's pronounced, and that's how it's pronounced, and really it's kind of difficult in that regard. The way scholars pronounce Koine Greek today is nothing like Greek people pronounce Greek today. Yeah, I you and know. we don't know if the Omicron and the, you know, when you get in the that's different point, O's, yeah. we, you know, we don't know if one was said one way or another, so... So, yeah, pronunciation is not as important, but the fact Omicron is the definition. Versus Omega, yeah. You know. yeah, no, amen. And But the thing is, is, it's important to know what these verses are talking about. And we went specifically not only to the apologia portion of that verse, but also the point, the point being made as an overall context, quoting from Isaiah chapter 8, uh, 12 through 14 mostly. But we talk about specifically when we look at that verse about sanctifying Christ as Lord, making sure that Christ is set apart as Lord. Before you ever give the defense, let's make sure that Christ is set apart as Lord in your heart. And as as Joe mentioned in the last episode, that word is translated a number of different ways. Sanctify, set apart, make holy, I believe, is a, another way of saying that. But nonetheless, it's all the same thing, making sure that Christ is set apart, make sure that he is first in your life. Amen. And also, when we are talking about these texts, just as P- Peter does here, Paul did in his other letters as well, using ho curios or using curios as a means of showing that the curios is the same person of the Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton Lord, in yes. the Old Yahweh. Testament, that Yahweh, Lord, all capital, L-O-R-D. When you see that in all caps, In the Old Testament, typically if you have your Bible open, you see that what that means is, not typically, but always what that means is it is the Tetragrammaton, which is the YHWH. It's why we call God Yahweh. And And the very name of God, yeah. And the very name of God. Personal name of God, yeah. And so you see him using that, and we see that that's who's being talked about quite clearly in Isaiah 8, and Peter applies that to Jesus here. 
So first, before you get into apologetics, you got to make sure you have Jesus right. I see a lot of these guys, popular guys, you know, we talked about in the prophecy movement, he passed away. Irvin Baxter, who's the one that's Pentecostal. You know, there's guys that are involved like Marcus Rogers and Brandon Tatum. They're really big in the political scene, but you find out that they're absolutely heretical in terms of what they understand in terms of the deity of Christ. And so it's really, really important that we have this right, because you can't start in apologetics if you get Jesus wrong. You can't set him apart as Lord if you don't know that he is truly the Lord. Amen. So these things are really, really important. So we went over that. We went over uh, what sanctify means as as the set apart. We talked about what it means to give a defense. Uh, specifically, it's this, this idea of someone coming against you with what would be an accusation or the three times it's used in the New Testament is category. It's used in John 18, used in 1 Timothy about bringing an accusation against an elder and also in Titus about that no one could come and bring an accusation as well against an elder. And that would be the categoria where the apologia would be the defense to that accusation. So when somebody brings up a lofty speculation or something against the knowledge of God, we bring it captive to the obedience of Christ and we do that through apologetics, giving a defense. So that leads us into the next portion of the verse, which is a really, really important, uh, I think probably the most, not, I, I, I feel guilty when I say it, because it's important, we want to sanctify Christ the Lord in our hearts. But this right idea of though. hope, this I, uh, this hope. understanding of Christ who is our hope, and that being the reason, and I believe personally when I look at this verse, someone seeing you have a hope, mm -hmm. right? Recognizing why does that person have a joy? Why does that person have, because they have a hope, they have a joy. And they see that in you, which causes them to ask the question. You pointed out this and I love pointing it out, too, from 1 Peter chapter 4, and you did this in your message last night, that they marvel and malign you because you, you don't walk in the dissipations, the sinful habits that other people are walking in, and they marvel and malign you. So what and they're we see, surprised you don't run with them to get drunk and everything. Amen. And what we see in 1 Peter is these three things that happen from your the way that your conduct is in this world as you walk as resident aliens— you, they marvel, malign, and guess what? They're caused to ask this question, which, as I said, I almost feel good. It's like picking a favorite Bible verse or a favorite <laughs> book, right? My favorite portion here. But I believe actually having this hope is the reason why you have that defense, which is the reason why you can be sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, having this hope within you that someone sees and says, Joe, why do you have this hope? Yeah. <laughs> uh, if they ask you, when they ask you regarding the hope that's in you, we're not supposed to be like, man, what do I say? We're supposed to be ready, ready always, he says. Yeah. And the context, and, and Chad uh, kind of really did a good job of summing up our last show. Uh, it's imper imperative that you understand the context regarding how important this is, regarding giving the answer for what the hope is that you have, and the context in which they are drawn to ask it. Because it's not like they may or may ask, you may or may not ask you about the hope that's in you. When you're salt and you're light in the world, and you are sanctifying Christ as Lord in your hearts, as Yahweh, you're putting them first, it's going to happen eventually, or it should happen eventually, uh, depend, unless you're barely around anybody. But because, and that's if you're sanctifying Christ as Lord in your heart, and you're, and you're going through trials, you're going through things, and people are watching your life, they're going to be inquisitive to one degree or another. Uh, and, and, you know, they may not come up and say specifically, so why do you have this incredible hope in you, you know? <laughs> but they'll inquire about your faith, uh, very likely. And I just want to encourage you uh, to consider the context here, Again, as Chad mentioned, and I'm just going to condense it to a 30-second part of what he mentioned already, context in Isaiah is the Syrians are coming. They're fearing the Assyrians. God says, don't fear them. Don't say conspiracy, conspiracy. He says, don't fear them, but to regard me as holy. Okay. Peter takes up on that in verse 14. He says, don't fear the persecution. If they're going to, you know, what can they, how can they harm you if you do what's right? And then what, he, what does he say? He says, but regard the Lord as holy. Same thing. Mm -hmm. But sanctify the Lord Yahweh, Christ, as Yahweh. When you look at the fact that he's quoting from the Septuagint, Yahweh, quoting that verse, this intertextual uh, parallel there, showing that he believed Jesus is God, no doubt about it. And as you do that, people are going to freak out because when you go through the trials that you're going to be going through in this world that we live in, especially in the first century with regard to the persecution that they were undergoing, and Paul said, all those who live God in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. We will also have situations like that. And the world is getting darker. And postmodernism, and we're just so far away from uh, truth and, and, and the faith that it's going to get darker and darker. And it gives you an opportunity to shine brighter and brighter. So as we do that, people will recognize that 
we don't wilt like your average person under pressure as Christians because we have a hope that they don't understand. It's like we should just be just, you know, Christians should be crawling under rocks the way the persecution is going to come. But we're going to be bold for Christ. Amen. And as we're bold for Christ, you're going to be like, they're going to take notice. Like, man, and not just bold for Christ because a little bit he's going to, we're going to see he talks about with gentleness and respect. We're going to be loving to even those who are hostile toward us and it's going to freak them out. So we need to let them know about the hope that we have. So what I did in preparation for a study I did on this, I started looking throughout Peter for the different places uh, wherein, you know, how is our hope defined in 1 Peter? And I was amazed because I found 12 different places that Peter magnifies our hope, and it's all about Christ. He is the blessed hope, amen? Christ in us, as Paul says, the hope of glory. Uh, but let's start going through these, and I kind of put these in an order that would fit basically the incarnation to the resurrection uh, to his second coming, and I came up with 12. The first aspect of our hope I want to emphasize that's emphasized also in 1 Peter is the incarnation, that 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 uh, this one who is Yahweh, who you're supposed to exalt as Yahweh in your heart, uh, became a man. And in 1 Peter 1.20, it says, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, before he became a man. John says the word became flesh, right? But he has appeared in these last days for the sake of you. So he became a man, the incarnation. Jesus lived in and even the skeptics, man, when you listen to the atheists today, this wasn't true decades ago. But now atheists will acknowledge, yeah, begrudgingly, almost every one of them, almost every one. And the ones that don't acknowledge it, they're looked at as being, you know, willfully ignorant to a degree, uh, that Jesus Christ existed, you know. And, you know, he's either, as we say, liar or Lord, you know. It's only two options. Some say, no, there's three, liar, lunatic, or Lord. No, because if he's a lunatic, he'd still be lying, Okay. Uh, so he's either a liar or a lord, and he's obviously not a liar. Uh, what he said would come to pass is being fulfilled now. He's actually the fulfillment of Old Testament passages as well. No, and one of the great themes also in First Peter, as we're talking about this, when he's bringing up hope here, one of the things he says multiple times, he uses the word precious, but one of the ones that sticks out to me uh, specifically is when he tells us to hold on to his precious and magnificent promises. Yeah, and that's in Second Peter 1, right? Second Peter 1, Second Peter 1, exactly right. Same author, though. And, and First Peter, also, he, he talks about the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, the word precious was sticking out to me. But but nonetheless, uh, Peter himself, as the author, those two sets, of those the, the, that verse in Second Peter, the holding on to the precious and magnificent promises, it reminded me so much of also having up the shield of faith when the enemy throws out these darts. And something we had talked about as a group as we're sharing the gospel and you know different people deal with different problems. And we were talking specifically about putting up that shield of faith, you know, because we never trade the things that we may not understand for the things we already know to be true about God. And, you know, I said, you know, my, and my poor dad and, and whole family being mechanics, it's an embarrassing thing to tell the truth. But the truth is, is that I know nothing about cars. I have no idea how my car runs. I have no idea how the engine, I don't know where the, anything, it's pretty bad. You have a great theological mind. And, and, <laughs> but you know what I do know? I do know gifts. if I don't put gas in my car, it will not run. And so when my car is out of gas, I don't go, oh dude, but I have no idea how the valves work. I don't know anything. So what do I do? No, I know I need to put gas in this thing Amen, so I can turn it on and run. And it's the same way. If you're having those problems, let's hold on to those precious and magnificent promises that we have in Christ and recognize them, hold them tight, put up that shield of faith. So when the enemy is shooting his darts and his arrows, he hits the hits that's the shield right. of faith. You may not time. be able to explain the hypostatic union perfectly, yeah, which true. no one can, <laughs> but you can understand who Jesus is and that he came and that he died for you, rose again. Uh, number two, the second hope we read about in uh, Peter is 1 Peter 2.22, that Jesus committed no sin. He isn't mm -hmm. just, he is God good. of the flesh, but he withstood all the temptations he faced. And we read in 1 Peter 2.22, he who committed no sin, nor was any deceit, found in his mouth, which is an, an allusion again to Isaiah, not chapter 8 this time, but Isaiah chapter 53, the prophecies about the coming Messiah, Amen. Uh, which is awesome. And I love I love intertextual things, man. And Peter's just, <laughs> that's, that's why, the, the scripture is so awesome because it sheds more light. So then you go to that passage, uh, Peter's referencing, which he's also referencing in that context him being like a lamb led to the slaughter and by his stripes we are healed. I mean, he's all over Isaiah 53 right there, which you don't have time to get into, but it's about Christ's crucifixion That's there, true. which is absolutely amazing when you think about it. And he's letting us know that he was sinless. And to be uh, the, the Lamb of God uh, who went to the slaughter for us uh, and also the good shepherd there, uh, he had to be without sin because the sin offerings in the Old Testament had to be without blemish. And, and he was without sin. And 
Peter would have known. <laughs> Peter spent a few years with Jesus, and Peter uh, was corrected a number of times by Jesus. But he says he's without he's without, without any deceit, committed no sin. There was no deceit in his mouth. And uh, and by the way, as you follow him and follow his example, you become a light because people are able to see Christ in you through your walks. And the third, uh, I should say, he, yeah, he committed no sin. Number three, which is a huge part of our hope, is he died for our sins. Amen. Because it wasn't enough for him to be without sin. He had to actually pay the price to tell us that paid in full, pay our sin debt. And that's, to me, the most beautiful thing about the gospel is, is his great love where he gave himself for us. And, and rarely will someone die even for righteous man, Paul says. But while we were sinners, we were criminals, we were enemies of God, uh, he died for us. That's just mind-boggling. Uh, so 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with, the perishable, with perishable things like silver or gold, so I love how he just kind of like trounces what the world considers valuable Amen. from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood. There's that word precious. You were mentioning that. futile too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Empty, yeah. right? But with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. I love uh, 1 Peter 2.24, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. So, and that, I just love that. So he gave himself for us. He died in our place. And that's number three. Yeah, and you know what was really cool is we were going out door to door, and I, you know, everyone's different on how they share the gospel. But that, as he, as Joe already said, to tell us that I paid him full. That's one I always have. I always bring up. Of some, you have the sayings of Jesus on the cross, but that paid in full. That the debt was paid, and I love that. And so to have that as one of our hopes, that that's right up at the top of the list for me. Amen, bro. <laughs> and that's what we share with people. What he did. Yeah. We were, we, you know, sometimes we'll give them the good person test. You yep, know, yep. have you lied? Have you stolen? Have you? And of course, they all stand guilty. You don't even got to ask them if if they've lied. You I don't just say how many have you told? Yeah, I don't think I've ever <laughs> given somebody the so-called good person test and have them said, "No, I'm perfect. I'm without sin." And they say that, you know, First John liar, one eight, yeah. First John ten, <laughs> he says, "Without sin, the liar, the truth is in him." So uh, it's interesting. But number four is, it's through his death that he brought us to God, reconciliation. That's part of our hope. Is he didn't just die for our sins in doing that. He becomes the way, the truth, and the life. He, uh, he is the living way into the holy place whereby we can have fellowship with God. In fact, 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also died for sins once for all. Not over and over again as in Catholicism or continuing Amen. death. Uh, the just for the unjust. Okay, not a limited atonement. He died for the unjust. That's all the wicked. So that he might bring us to God. Reconciliation. So he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit, whereby he went and preached the spirit in prison and so forth. So number number four he reconciled us to the Father. He brought us to the Father. That's a big part of our hope. Number five, he rose from the dead. And I love how <laughs> Peter begins his epistle and he addresses it to those, you know, who are in these different areas, who are elect, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. And then in verse three, the very anchor of our hope. Verse three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Number, four, number five, guys, uh, brothers and sisters, is the resurrection. That's our hope. You know, he rose from the dead. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Notice it's called the living hope. But Peter says to give her, be ready always to give an answer for the hope that's in you or, or defense for the hope that's in you. He starts the book off by talking about the hope of the resurrection. It's through faith in Christ, his, his gospel, that we're actually born again, that we have new life. And that's based on the fact that he has risen from the dead. And Paul said, if, you know, if he didn't rise from the dead, our faith is in vain. Amen? So that's a huge part of your hope because there's no resurrection. Our faith is in vain because then he didn't really conquer the grave. Uh, he, he was risen for our justification. His, his resurrection vindicates the fact that he, his atonement was accepted by the Father on the cross and shows that he indeed is the Son of God. No, and I love the resurrection one that you, you put out because— when it comes to not only the Bible, but when it comes to Christianity as a whole, it, it is a falsifiable uh, claim. It's one that could have been falsified by the very audience that it was being written to. And I love when we talk about the resurrection. And one of the cool things is you guys are a part of the Good Fight Radio Show. You guys who like and subscribe and so forth. And you guys who are involved on our Good Fight Ministries YouTube channel. You guys know we had literally the top scholar on the subject. Dr. Gary Habermas sat down with us. We talked with him for an hour on a lot of it was on the resurrection and the Amazing evidences. Amazing apologists. And just, I mean, it's incredible the amount of evidence. It's so, 
it's an embarrassment, honestly, when you hear some of the accusations. I know you went through it as well on your resurrection message back in April, where you talked about specifically some of the, the special pleading, the bad argumentation for, well, we have to have something. There's some reason that all these men uh, would die for something they knew whether or not was true. And we point out all the time when it comes to people like, well, look at you know people in Islam, they blow themselves up and so forth. They have no idea about the claims of Muhammad and whether or not they're getting 72 virgins. They have no idea if they're guaranteed in paradise if they do uh, you know, commit uh, jihad and so forth. But the fact is the disciples knew whether or not Jesus died and rose again. It says he gave them many convincing proofs over 40 days in, the very, in the Acts chapter 1. We see over and over again when it comes to the resurrection, they all knew and they went from cowards who all ran away some naked, right? <laughs> we talked about that on another show. All ran away to all of a sudden bold as a lion, able to be crucified upside down when Peter says in Second Peter that Jesus had told him he was going to die. And, and that was at a, a restoration time where Jesus was restoring him and told him he was going to die. And the disciples as well, or then you have John having to be exiled to Patmos and some of the lives they lived after running away from Jesus. So we know the resurrection without a doubt. It's a historical fact. It's a biblical fact. Amen. And we amen get to that, hold man. on to it. <laughs> Absolutely, bro. Uh, number number five, and we want to kind of camp out, don't we? Yeah, yeah it's one I know. of these, right? Sorry, yeah. No, don't. Tony no, gave man. us the time mark. No, too, preach so. it. You know, I know we just put up those 10 minutes like four <laughs> minutes ago. So we got half of them to go through here and we still have to get with gentleness and respect. So, yes, Lord God, yes. have mercy on us. Uh, let's we'll hit these ones quick though, okay. uh, because you know what? If we're going to take any time, it's going to be on the death and the resurrection, right? Amen. But he ascended to heaven. Okay, yeah, yeah. he ascended to heaven, and in chapter three of Peter, First Peter three twenty two, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven. So Jesus ascended to heaven. That's our hope too, because he's at the right hand of the Father. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Book of Hebrews, love Hebrews chapter one, Romans chapter eight. You know, he's our advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous against our uh, prosecuting attorney, Satan, advocate uh, in uh, First John. I'm doing exactly what I didn't want to do, right? Go on and on. Uh, but number seven, uh, you know what? He didn't only ascend to heaven, but guess what? He holds supremacy. All power in heaven and earth is given unto me, says Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, uh, verse 18. Every knee and every tongue, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord, right? But even now, right now, we read in chapter 3, verse 22, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven. But the next part says this, after angels and authority and powers have been subjected to him. He's the head of all these principalities and powers, all these demonic hordes, all Satan and the principalities, they've been, they're already subject to him, but through his death now, they don't have power over us. They don't have power over, uh, uh, you know, it says those who lived in fear in Hebrews chapter two, verses 12 through 14, that he set us free through his death on the cross from Satan who kept us in fear uh, and, and in bondage to the, uh, a death and so forth. The, the Son of God is set us free, but he's supreme over all. He's the greatest and the ultimate superhero. He's God in the flesh, and that's an awesome one. So he's the greatest of all. And then number eight, he's coming again, you know? Uh, and in 1 Peter 1, 13, it says this, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on grace, the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I think that's the word apocalypsis. I didn't look it up, it but I think it is there, right? So uh, we're looking forward to his coming. And Chad, didn't Peter say something about being an eyewitness of his glory and a picture of the resurrection? Yeah, 2 Peter chapter 1, 16 through 21. I mean, quite clearly. He even I mean, goes, I don't want to hurry, but say a little bit about that, bro. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's one of those things when we talk about the man of transfiguration and we talk about Jesus being Jesus being there and you have Moses and Elijah, you have the father literally speaking audible words to Peter. And he says of that event, this momentous event, we were eyewitnesses. We don't follow cleverly devised tales, which could have meant that he wrote this alongside of other guys that were there, maybe. But either way, what he says is that we have a word more sure in the word of God than even a voice speaking from the clouds, which is Amen. amazing. He's an eyewitness of his coming. It was, a, it was a preview of coming attractions when he saw him lit up like the sun. Amen. You know? preview of the second coming. Uh, and nine, uh, I love this, and this is part of the hope that we have, is that we're secure in Christ, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we're secure in him. Jesus said, you know, uh, you know uh, that he and the Father are great and all. No one can snatch out of their hands or pazo, you know? Yeah, we can commit a posse and leave his hands, but nobody can snatch us out right. of the enemy. We're secure. If you're trusting Jesus and your faith is in him, you have security in Christ. And that's beautiful because 1 Peter 1, 5 says, it speaks of those who are kept, King James or NASB, who are protected by the power of God 
through faith, through faith. for salvation to be revealed at the last time. It's not about our final salvation. Not so through our unfaithfulness. Kept. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, there's a condition there. We're, yeah. Just Amen. like we're saved by grace through faith, we're kept by faith, Amen. too, it says. We're kept by the power of God through faith. But indeed, we are being kept. And that's just such a, a beautiful a beautiful promise. Uh, number 10, he's a good shepherd who guides me. I mean, he's, he's my hope because guess what? I'm going to share with people, you know, guess what? God, he guides me into all truth by his word. He's a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. The Holy Spirit convicts me, encourages me, strengthens us as believers. And we read uh, in uh, 1 Peter 2, 25, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. I love that, man, because all these things are true about Jesus. But as he is Lord and I exalt him and as you exalt him, Chad, and as our brothers and sisters, you exalt Jesus as Lord in your hearts. Guess what? You sanctify him. You set apart. You say, you are Lord. Guess what? He protects you and he keeps you, but he also guides you. He directs you. He speaks to your heart through his word by his spirit. And that's such a, a beautiful, beautiful truth. And it reminds me of Proverbs 3, you know, 4 and 5 or 5 and 6, where it says, lean not on your own understanding, but all in things acknowledge him and he'll He'll make He's your path straight, straight and so forth. Number 11, he gives joy and victory in trials. That's another reason, man, he is my hope. Because no matter what, hell or high water, no, no matter what we face as believers, as ugly as things get in your life, you can know that he's promised that he'll work all things together for the good for those who love him and are the call the according to his purpose. And that Paul said also, that's a great verse, 28, but verse 18 of the same chapter in Romans 8 is very good too. I think it's pretty much just as good that these present sufferings that we undergo can't be compared to the glory that we revealed in us. Amen. So we have all these promises. He makes all things beautiful in this time. But Peter, this is number 11. And Peter, I love the way he puts this. He says in 1 Peter 1, uh, 1 or 6 and 7, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire. We have this incredible uh, you know, testing that goes on but it proves and strengthens our faith and it makes us like gold, Peter says, our faith like gold. Number 12, uh, he's going to welcome us with open arms. And it <laughs> says, after he will, if we test by fire, it says that you may be found in him to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that means he's going to welcome you with, he's, you're going to praise and honor and glory from Jesus. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. So man, that's another big part of our hope is the heavenly hope that we're going to get to be with our Lord forever. Isn't this book rich, man? So when you're saying, what is my hope that I'm supposed to share? Well, we just shared 12 things with you, but really quickly, Chad, we got to get the last two things, the last thing really quick. Last, the last thing really, I'm going to throw it at you. You got about a minute to answer this thing. It ends us, this entire verse, this text, this First Peter 3 text, with, with gentleness and respect as some have. Yeah, and you know what? If you miss this, I'm sorry. This is, we only got a minute left for this. But you need to make sure you're not just an apologist to have an answer, but that you're gentle. And Paul said the bondservant of the Lord must be gentle at mm -hmm. the end of 2 Peter chapter 2. Paul said to speak the truth in love. That's something you and I need to pray about constantly because we have this old man, the flesh, that might want to get up. And Jesus, Paul, uh, Peter says with gentleness and respect, respect or reverence toward God, gentleness toward the person you're speaking to, but Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 24, that he's left as an example that we should follow in his step. And it's like tracing papers, the Greek word for example there. So it's to trace his steps. And that goes on to say he was reviled, but didn't revile back. Now, if the Son of God was reviled, but he didn't revile back, and we're just his servants, we need to make sure we don't revile back. We need to pray about that. When people become antagonistic and so forth, say, Father, help me speak in love to them and don't return evil for evil. A soft answer turns away wrath. But let me show Christ because Jesus said, in John 13, that by your love for one another, they'll, they'll know that you're my disciples. In John 17, two different times, Jesus talked about how when we see people see our love, the love of, that we have as believers, they'll know that the Father sent him. That's, that's an apologetic in itself, is being Christ-like in your witness as you exalt Jesus as Lord in your heart, and you become like him. Amen. Love you guys.